Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Linode. In today's video, we're going to talk about Terraform. No, I'm not talking about terraforming other planets, although if Linux has a hand in that, that would be very, very cool. Actually, what we're going to talk about in today's video is Terraform from a company called HashiCorp. Now, even though the topic today is Terraform, the larger theme for this video and others that are going to be like it is around infrastructure as code. Now, infrastructure as code is the ability to well-define infrastructure with code. You write code in a format or a style that's understood by the utility that you're using, and then that utility translates those particular commands into actual instructions for configuring your environments. And an even shorter summary is that, well, infrastructure as code helps you automate things. And if your organization asks you to spin up 100 servers, sure, you could absolutely do that. And you could do that manually if you wanted to, but it's better to have tools. And Terraform is just one of those tools that's going to help you do that more efficiently. However, there's going to be some things that we need to define around infrastructure as code that's required for understanding where Terraform fits into this particular occasion. And more specifically, in this video, it's more of an overview of Terraform. So if you already know what Terraform is and the goals that it attempts to solve, then this video may not be as helpful to you as it might be for those of you that have not used something like Terraform before. But in this video, we're going to just talk about what Terraform is as well as the goal that it helps you solve. Other videos on this channel are going to dive into more specific things within that as far as how to actually use the software. But if you've never actually used Terraform before, then this is going to be the overview video that you won't want to miss. I mentioned earlier that there's some things that we have to define before we get to Terraform. So let's take care of that right now. And the first thing that I'm going to define is declarative infrastructure. So what exactly is declarative infrastructure? With infrastructure as code, you define a series of configurations that must exist as well as the individual steps that are needed to carry out those tasks. Typically, this will consist of a programming or scripting language that's used to provide instructions to an infrastructure as code utility that will then carry out those tasks. And by the end of the process, you'll have infrastructure that matches the intended design and purpose. Ansible and Terraform are great examples of infrastructure as code solutions. Within infrastructure as code, we have the subtopics of declarative and imperative infrastructure. With imperative infrastructure, the focus is on how something happens, while declarative infrastructure primarily focuses on what in particular happens. More specifically, with imperative infrastructure, a series of commands are defined, commands that can be executed to ensure that the resource reaches its desired state. For example, if you are setting up a web server, perhaps you'll run a command to install system patches, then you'll install a web server application, maybe something like Apache. And then after that, you'll install the files that you intend to serve through that web server. To reach that desired state, you'll either execute those commands one after another manually, or even better, give those commands to a configuration management utility to carry out those tasks for you. Declarative infrastructure saves the overall state, and anytime adjustments are made to the intended state, Declarative infrastructure tools will ensure those resources exist as you've defined them. In addition, declarative infrastructure is able to undo any configurations that are performed, such as decommissioning infrastructure that you're no longer using. However, declarative infrastructure is not as concerned with the specifics as imperative infrastructure happens to be. An easier and perhaps overly simplified way to think of the difference between them is that declarative infrastructure ensures that infrastructure itself exists while imperative infrastructure takes something that already exists and then fine tunes it to reach its desired complete state. In the case of the tools Ansible and Terraform, which I mentioned earlier, those are actually great examples of the difference between those particular types of infrastructure. Terraform is a utility that can create infrastructure components such as networks and servers. You can define network subnets, routing tables, as well as servers themselves. You can configure Terraform to build a cloud server with a specific number of cores and amount of RAM, as well as the network that the server has access to. Ansible, on the other hand, takes your infrastructure to the next level by actually executing commands against the components within your infrastructure. And when it comes to Terraform and Ansible, you don't have to choose one or the other because they solve different goals. In fact, they work very well together. Terraform, for example, can create a server for you, and then Ansible can configure that server by installing a web server package, installing updates, creating users, setting passwords, or whatever else you want to happen on that server. 
In that example, Terraform is declarative, while Ansible is imperative. Terraform creates infrastructure components, and Ansible manages the configuration of those components right down to the commands that are needed to be executed to bring a component to its desired state. Now, before we go into Terraform a little bit deeper, there is another component or concept that I would like to bring up, and that concept is version control. Now, version control is technically a completely different thing when compared to Terraform and Ansible. Version control solutions, such as Git, for example, are heavily used when it comes to software engineers because they use version control to keep track of their source code. But if you didn't already know, version control comes in quite handy with us administrators because we also use it to track changes as well. Sure, we might not all write software, and you might think that version control has no place here because, well, it's a software engineering tool, isn't it? Well, yes, primarily, but version control utilities can absolutely be used with solutions like Terraform and Ansible, and in fact, it's highly recommended. And that's because version control solutions help you control revisions to files, and it enables you to track any changes made to those files over time. And when it comes to files, those are stored in what's known as a repository, and that's where you would store each file that belongs to a particular project. Version control solutions themselves are very popular with software engineers like I mentioned. While developing an application, an engineer can track each and every change made to the source code files, and if an individual change causes an undesired effect, an engineer can revert any and all files involved with that change to an earlier state. But that's not all. Version control solutions make it much easier for multiple engineers to work on the same files and also keep track of which person is working on each component. Nowadays, version control is no longer specific to software engineers. System administrators, for example, as well as DevOps engineers, they use version control quite commonly to keep track of the files and components of their infrastructure's code solutions. For example, there might be a repository that's being used to store configuration files for Terraform, and perhaps another repository stores Ansible playbooks. If a new server is to be provisioned, then an administrator will create the files that are necessary to bring the organization's infrastructure to that state. Other team members will see the changes in version control that the individual has made, and may even offer suggestions, possibly even notice mistakes before the new configuration is actually deployed into production. In addition to that, version control also improves collaboration as well. With each administrator being able to view the same files, it's much easier for someone to suggest improvements to the overall design. By creating what's known as a pull request, an administrator can suggest those improvements to the larger team. If a pull request is accepted, then it becomes part of the overall design. Without version control, then you'd have a situation where each administrator is keeping track of their own config files, and it would be a very difficult job to manage a clean, consistent state at that point. Now, the reason why version control is so important when it comes to things like Terraform is because Terraform is what a lot of organizations use to define all of their infrastructure. But what happens if you want to improve the design? Maybe you want to change the image to a newer Linux distribution. Maybe you want to change the instance type to have more cores or something like that. Well, it's very easy to track changes in version control and view those changes over time. And when something goes wrong, it's much easier to do a root cause analysis when it comes to what change in particular helped introduce a problem into the design. But in addition to everything I've just mentioned, consistency is also a benefit of version control. If a team of, let's say, four administrators are spinning up servers, and each of them does so in their own way, then in that case, it'll be much harder to fix any problems that might come up. If the team doesn't do a good job when it comes to documenting what they've done, then the situation becomes even harder to investigate. Worse, without standards, human error becomes even more common. With infrastructure as code, your entire infrastructure becomes a template. Each component will be created to match a very specific standard. The infrastructure can be created, destroyed, and recreated again and again and again, and each time that happens, everything will be set up exactly the same way. This also saves time, as administrators won't have to worry about manually building anything, they could focus on the end result since each step in the process of deploying infrastructure would be completely automated. Now, a major benefit when it comes to version control and also infrastructure as code in general is that human error will happen a lot less often. The fact is, we're not perfect. We all make mistakes. Even if we've done something hundreds of times and we have the entire process memorized, mistakes can and do still happen. 
with a version controlled infrastructure as code solution, there's going to be more people looking at the overall solution and your configuration management utility will carry out the instructions the exact same way each and every time it's run. So I've just discussed some very important concepts and components in an overall infrastructure's code solution and design. So let's expand a bit more on Terraform and how that helps us achieve our goals. Terraform, like I mentioned earlier, is a product of HashiCorp and it's an infrastructure as code solution with a focus on creating, modifying, and destroying servers, as well as any related cloud resources that you might want to manage. Terraform actually does a great job of that. It can create infrastructure that meets your exact specifications. If your project requires a cloud server with four cores, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and let's say 200 gigabytes of storage, that's no problem. Terraform can build such an instance as well as any related resources, such as the network that the server is going to run on. Now what Terraform won't do, however, is log into the freshly created server and install software, apply patches, or configure settings. That's a job for a configuration management solution such as Ansible. Now to be more specific, Terraform is able to log into instances and further configure them, but that's not actually what it's designed to do. When it comes to configuration management solutions like Ansible, its job is to perform configuration management and manage the settings in your infrastructure. Terraform, on the other hand, it's more focused on making things exist. And then configuration management solutions, again, like Ansible, is going to help configure things and bring them to a desired state. Now, what Terraform does is it simplifies the creation of cloud resources. I mentioned earlier that it's able to create VMs, it's able to create networks and so on. And Terraform is able to work with all of the popular cloud computing providers out there. Its syntax is largely universal. So the process of using Terraform is creating instructions that Terraform understands. And then Terraform itself does the work of translating those files into instructions that the cloud provider understands and then will carry out. Now Terraform is an immutable solution, which I'm going to get into very shortly, but part of the requirements for understanding that is also understanding what cloud native means. Terraform is a cloud native solution, but what exactly is a cloud native solution? Cloud native refers to application architecture that is designed to run on one or more clouds to build and scale applications from the initial development phase, as opposed to migrating existing on-premises or local infrastructure to the cloud. So basically, a cloud native solution is a solution that was built originally on the cloud rather than transferred into the cloud. Cloud native developments utilize modern application development techniques, including containerization, microservers, as well as declarative APIs. A key component of cloud native is immutable infrastructure. I mentioned just a moment ago that Terraform is an immutable solution. Immutable infrastructure refers to infrastructure that is always fresh, as opposed to being constantly modified. Terraform is an example of a solution that creates immutable infrastructure. When changes to infrastructure are designed and carried out, Terraform will primarily replace pieces of infrastructure rather than making actual changes to existing components within that infrastructure. For example, let's say you've had Terraform build a cloud server, and that cloud server utilizes Ubuntu 20.04. Now your organization has decided to upgrade to Ubuntu 20.04. At this point, what you could do is, well, log into the instance and manually upgrade it, but we really don't want to do anything manually if we can help it. Now, if your infrastructure is managed by Terraform, and Terraform originally created the instances that you use, you might actually adjust your Terraform files to reference Ubuntu 2204 rather than the original distribution. When you do that, what Terraform won't do is log into the instance and upgrade it. Instead, Terraform will actually delete the server entirely and recreate it from scratch, this time using the Ubuntu 22.04 image. But you might be wondering then, why doesn't Terraform just upgrade the Linux distribution within the server instance rather than creating an entirely new instance? Well, one common issue that administrators often run into is when they're troubleshooting a solution to a problem with the servers and trying to narrow down that problem to the root cause, you know, trying to find out what caused the initial issue to happen in the first place. The underlying issue can be the result of a bug, for example, that's been introduced since the original server was set up. Or perhaps the issue might even be the result of incompatible changes that have been made during the history of the server in the past. With Terraform, you'll have clean and fresh server instances built each and every time. Administrators won't have to worry about past changes within the server causing problems later on, since there's no stateful information or historic changes within the server instance itself at least when it comes to changes and things like that. 
This also makes it very easy for administrators to use the same Terraform files to spin up a similar test environment, which can help the troubleshooting process by enabling them to compare the new server build to the current one. Another key component of cloud native solutions is portability. This allows administrators to define infrastructure that will function exactly the same regardless of the underlying cloud platform. For example, if you use other cloud providers in addition to Linode, then that means you utilize multi-cloud applications. In that case, it would be a lot of work to manually recreate the same infrastructure each time on each platform. Instead, it's better to define the desired state one single time and have those same instructions carried out on each of the platforms that you use. Therefore, a solution that you create once and is carried out the same way across cloud environments is a portable solution. Taking the conversation back to Terraform, as I mentioned earlier, Terraform supports each of the major cloud providers that exist today. Using Terraform, you can create configurations that can build infrastructure the same way regardless of the underlying cloud platform. Now, considering that I've mentioned Terraform files several times in this video, Let's actually take a closer look at how an example Terraform file is structured. And that's what you see on the screen right now. You're seeing an actual Terraform configuration file. Now the files that Terraform will look for and use will have an extension of .tf. These files are written in the HashiCorp configuration language or HCL for short. And these files break down critical commands into the following elements. And the first is blocks and they're usually used to define the configuration for a resource or service, such as an instance from a cloud provider. Arguments, on the other hand, assign values to names appearing within a block. Expressions refer to syntax that represents value and are used as values within arguments. Next, resources. Infrastructure resources that can be managed by Terraform include compute instances, DNS records, and network resources. There's also the concept of dependencies and that refers to Terraform resources that depend on another resource to exist. When one resource depends on another, it will be created after the resource it depends on, even if it is listed before the other resource in your configuration file. We also have input variables. Those are symbolic names associated with a value and are also, well, referred to as simply variables. Another concept is resource declarations. These correspond with the components of your Linode infrastructure, Linode instances, block storage volumes, and so on. There's also resource provisioners. These are scripts and commands in your local development environment or on Terraform managed servers that are performed when you apply your Terraform configuration. Now, if you're wanting an example of Terraform in action, well, I'm working on a video that you're going to love and it's dedicated to that exact topic. It's going to actually show you the process of using Terraform and Ansible as well as Jenkins to provision resources here on Linode. Now, what I recommend you do is subscribe to this channel so that way when that video comes out, if it isn't out already, you could be the first to be aware of that and check that video out as soon as it debuts. But in this video, I wanted you to be aware of some of the key components when it comes to infrastructure as code, especially Terraform, which is going to be the bigger subject in today's video. Terraform is awesome, and I highly recommend that you check it out. What are your thoughts on configuration management, infrastructure as code, and any of the other concepts that I brought up in this video? Well, let us know in the comments down below. And in the meantime, I'm working on some awesome content for this channel that I can't wait for you to see. So I'm going to get back to that. But thank you so much for checking out this video. I really appreciate it.